So a Rolling Stone report talk about a chaotic, toxic shooting. So what's your reaction to this uh, accusation? When my, when my wife read me the article, I looked at her and I just, <laughs> I just said, I think we're about to have the biggest show of the summer. The Idol is a television series which aired on HBO for five episodes between early June and early July 2023. The series was co-created by Sam Levinson, best known for adapting the Israeli TV series Euphoria for an obscenely successful US version, Abel Tesfaye, best known as international pop sensation The Weeknd, and Reza Fahim, one of Abel's close creative partners. It follows Jocelyn, a famous pop star who is staging a comeback after the death of her mother and a psychotic breakdown. She meets artist manager Tedros at his club in LA, and the two immediately hit it off. Tedros seeks to help Joss with her music, which she feels has become creatively vacant. However, she soon finds that Tedros has unorthodox or even abusive methods to get performances out of his talent. In theory, the main crux of the show is this dynamic between the two. How far Joss is willing to let Tedros push her in the pursuit of great art. How far Joss's team will allow her to go down that rabbit hole and how far Tedros thinks he can manipulate Joss. In practice, though... Can stretch that tiny little <sighs> the Idol is not good for a myriad of reasons, and I would like to explore those reasons today. But first, some backstory. The Idol was announced in June 2021 by Abel, with Amy Simons attached to direct the project. The synopsis at the time was, a female pop singer starts a romance with an enigmatic LA club owner who is the leader of a secret cult. Later that same year, HBO confirmed a six-episode season order, as well as actors signed to the project such as Lily Rose Depp, Susanna Sun, Troy Sivan, Tundaya Debimpe, and Hesh, Melanie LeBird, and others. It also apparently had a cameo from Britney Spears if this Instagram caption next to a cat with a wine glass is to be believed. In April 2022, news broke that Amy had left the project with about 80% filmed. Sam Levinson stepped in to replace her as director. The reason was an anticipated overhaul of the entire show, with big changes to story and cast. When it comes to the latter, nearly everyone from the original cast was taken off the project, except for Lily Rose, Abel, Susanna, and Troy. In their play, Place, we got Hari Neff, Rachel Sennett, Dan Levy, Moses Sumney, Eli Roth, Jane Adams, Ramsey, Mike Dean, Divine Joy Randolph, Hank Azaria, and Jenny Ruby Jane from Blackpink. Responses to this news on social media ranged from excitement over Jenny from Blackpink's casting to excitement over Jenny from Blackpink's casting. Months went by without any real update until in March 2023, Rolling Stone reported on the alleged drama behind the scenes. The piece included info such as, the shift in the show was allegedly brought about by Abel, who wanted to downplay the cult aspect of the story. He also allegedly felt that Lily Rose's character was getting too much tension, and the show was heading too much into a, quote, female perspective. The show had allegedly gone off the rails when Amy came on, with unfinished scripts, a tight schedule, and a relatively small budget. The shoots, both before and after the change of director, were allegedly chaotic and stressful, resulting in scripts being written right up to or even past the deadline. And with Sam as director, the show had allegedly dialed up the sexual aspects dramatically. As one crew member said, it went from satire to the thing it was satirizing. The only immediate response from anyone involved in the show was from Abel. He posted a clip of the show with Abel and Joss's characters berating Rolling Stone. Rolling Stone? Are they a little irrelevant? It's a cover. 
It's a heritage brand. I think it's fail safe. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like it might be kind of past its prime. You know what I mean? Yeah, nobody cares about Rolling Stone. I've read other things about the reshoots, but at that point, I would just be playing Doomwa Detective and taking unverified Reddit comments as hard proof, and that's not fair to anyone involved in the show or my own standards of quality. So let's move on. With that context in mind, let me start this off by saying that I was actually pretty excited for the idol. The cast was full of people who had been involved in things that I personally enjoy. The trailers looked pretty good. I'm always interested in checking out films or TV shows that are about music or the music business or just the general creative process. The last big one I can think of was, um, Atlanta, which is a phenomenal show, one of my favorites of the past decade. You should check it out if you haven't seen it. Plus, it's especially not often that we get a show that is essentially a vehicle for a pop star. It reminded me of the days when Prince could make Purple Rain or Pink Floyd could make The Wall. The only comparable projects I could think of in recent years would be the short films Tom York and Sturgill Simpson did for Netflix. The weekend doing a big budget HBO version of that with a promising cast? I was pretty into it. But my excitement soon turned into sadness and confusion, and I am not alone in those feelings. If you watch any other video about the idol on YouTube, you are likely in for a recap of the show's story, punctuated by gasps and stunned looks at how explicit it gets. And don't get me wrong, the show is explicit. There's a reason those videos take that shape. But, I mean, they're kind of playing right into the game of it all? The idol wants to provoke you. It basically taunts you into having a strong reaction. That is honestly the only thing this show does consistently well. And while it can be loads of fun to trash the show's attempts at being sexy, or the way Abel says carte blanche. All right, let's say you had carte blanche, right? I'd like to take a more reasonable look at the entire show. The idol is a bad show, but I think some people say that to disguise their reasons for not liking one of these two men. And if that's you, I'm not gonna tell you to feel different. I'm not your dad, I'm not your orthodontist, but there are plenty of other people, both in front of and behind the camera, who worked on this. And there are definitely things that were done intentionally in service of a story. The story that the idol wants to tell is outrageous and at times offensive. In response to anything negative about the show, the cast's answer boils down to, people are talking about it, so we're winning. I think we're about to have the biggest show of the summer. But you want to know the real sin of the idol? It's not the sexy. Scenes. It's not the depictions of abuse. It's not the rat tail. The show is just boring. And to understand why it's boring, that's fascinating. I'm gonna try my best to keep this as PG as possible, but I will have to discuss some mature topics that are integral to the show, so some viewer discretion is advised. And I'm, uh, I'm spoiling things, but you're adults. Uh, <laughs> and the show's been out there and available, so just deal with it. This is a small issue in the grand scheme of things, but I wanted to start with it because I think it's a microcosm of the idol's greater issues. Like I said before, I enjoy films or other media that focus on the creative pursuit, its ups and downs. Two that I have in mind are Whiplash and Black Swan. Both are about artists seeking to create something incredible, and both feature said artist enduring emotional or physical abuse from some mentor in the hopes that they will create something incredible. What's crucial here is that both films end with the artist succeeding. Andrew Neiman performs a jaw-dropping drum solo as Fletcher and his father watch in awe. Nina Sayers delivers a breathtaking performance in The Black Swan, at one point transforming into The Black Swan. But what's also crucial is that both leave enough wiggle room to let the audience decide if their pursuit was ultimately worth it in the end. Sure, Andrew Solo is phenomenal, and he gets the nod of approval from Fletcher, but was that one moment worth the emotional abuse, the physical pain, the T-bone collision with a truck? And sure, Nina's performance is wonderful, but was it worth Nina losing her mind and stabbing herself in the stomach with a piece of glass? The film literally ends with her bleeding out as the screen fades to white, a not-so-subtle implication that she dies. Now, I'm not gonna tell you if Andrew and Nina's pursuits were worth it, because I think that's part of what makes their respective films great. They leave you wrestling with complex emotions about how far you'd be willing to push yourself to get what you want it. A big problem I have with The Idol, as a show centered around the darker side of the creative process, is that the show doesn't seem to 
actually care about the process. Here's what I mean. Towards the end of the first episode, Joss invites Tedros over to her house, which by the way is Abel's mansion in real life, fun fact which will matter more in a second. She shows him her new song, World Class Sinner, and he is unimpressed. He thinks her performance needs more. As their interaction gets more and more sexually charged, Tedros wraps Joss's head in the sheet. Joss is left gagging for air. Tedros cuts a hole in the sheet so she can breathe. And then this happens. Now you can say. Right before we get to see how Tedros's unorthodox methods could impact or even help Joss's music making, the episode ends. We do hear this remade version of World Class Sinner in the next episode when Joss shares it with her team, but it's just the first verse and a quarter of the chorus. Not helping is that it's basically the same song, but with a shakier vocal performance, some extra moaning, and a load of distortion on the chorus hook. Cause I know that you don't really know how to handle This is more or less how the show will proceed. Instead of showing you the creative process, the journey that Joss and some of these other characters go on to create great art, the show will simply tell you that they're making great art. Or it'll cut to Joss and Tedros having sex. In late June, one of the editors for The Idol, Julio C. Perez IV, gave an interview to IndieWire. He spoke about how the show was filmed with a multi-camera approach. This is in contrast to Euphoria's single-camera approach, which helps give it that trademark cinematic feel with all of the long, elaborate shots. The change in execution was inspired by the films of Robert Altman, as well as reality TV. But then there's this bit that sticks out to me. From IndieWire, according to Perez, there was a more practical rationale as well. Given that the whole series was reshot after an initial version was tossed out, capturing as much footage as quickly as possible was essential. Quote, Sam wouldn't make the decision merely for that, but it does allow you to get things done on a certain time frame, end quote, Perez said. IndieWire also casually mentions a, quote, greater degree of improvisation, not just in terms of the dialogue, but in terms of the blocking, end quote. This gave Perez an insane amount of footage to use, which led to his first cut of episode one being an hour and 45 minutes. This was then cut down with the help of the show's additional editors. So with that in mind, I have a theory. Imagine yourself as Sam Levinson. You and your creative partner, Mr. Weekend, decide to scrap the first pass of your new TV show, one that was 80% film. You've tweaked the story to your liking, you've brought in a whole new slew of actors to realize this new vision, and you start reshoots in early May 2022. But there are problems. You've already spent tens of millions on the first go-around, and you will need to spend even more tens of millions to complete it. Plus, your creative partner, your big leading man, the guy who, according to the Rolling Stone article, was the one pushing to redo the show? He only has until July before he kicks off a worldwide tour. And that's not even accounting for rehearsals or any other tour prep that would have demanded Abel's time. So what do you do? You find ways to do this as cheap and as quick as possible. You use your partner's Bel Air mansion to film, you shoot a scene at one of his concerts, and most crucially, you set up a whole lot of cameras, film as much as you can with your actors, improvising to some extent, and decide to figure it all out in the edit. Again. That's just my theory. If any of that is true, then it explains a lot. It explains the show's occasionally great moments where the cast's synergy feels effortless. It explains the aimless moments that feel unimportant to the overall story. But at the same time, if any of that is true, then it makes it really difficult to say what parts of the show are the result of the writing or the editing. What was written down, what was improvised, what was written or improvised but left on the cutting room floor. We will likely never know unless a shooting script leaks online. So for the purposes of this discussion, I'm going to lump the writing and the editing together as this ever-shifting vortex. There's a sequence in episode three that really stands out to me. 
As Jocelyn and Tedros are shopping, Joss's assistant Leia is outside the store on the phone with her managers, Haim and Destiny. At one point in their conversation, Leia mentions how Tedros fired Joss's chef. I'm, I'm sitting in the kitchen and I'm talking to Andreas. He just walks in and he fires him. Another 15 seconds of conversation go by. Then we cut to earlier in the day. Tedros is laying out the game plan and what things need to happen. Leia is clearly hesitant and says she needs approval from Joss. Leia, are you f***ing retarded? This scene is 45 seconds long. We cut back to Tedros and Joss doing more shopping. This bit is about 20 seconds long. Cut again to Leia on the phone for like five seconds, and then we cut once again to earlier in the day where Joss is showing her chef the progress she's made with her core, Tedros gets jealous and slaps him, and Joss is forced to fire him. Andres, I'm really sorry, I just don't, I don't know if this is the right fit anymore. I know there's some debate around the idea of show, don't tell, but I would love to know where everybody stands on tell, show something similar, go back to telling, and then finally show the thing you already told us a minute ago. It's so difficult to pin down what went wrong with this sequence. Did Rachel Sennett improvise the line about the chef being fired? Because if that wasn't there, I don't think I'd mind this sequence as much. Was this meant to show Tedros's tightening control over the house? Because the editors did that with the scene before so they didn't need another scene with the chef. Was the chef's firing meant to have more emotional weight behind it? He's not a big character. We only see him once before this during a montage with Joss, and he does not come up again for the rest of the show. I just don't get the point of this, of why you would stumble over yourself multiple times all just to deliver a very unimportant detail. Not helping the show's pace is the total of just five episodes for this whole story to happen. Now, let me clear up a misconception. The reveal at the end of episode four that the next episode would be the season finale had a lot of people surprised. This led to some theories that the season was cut short due to low ratings or terrible reviews. But that was not true. I mean, the low ratings and terrible reviews were true, but as further research would show, The Idol was indeed planned to have just five episodes after the creative overhaul. I'm aware that this show was only intended to have five episodes. Personally, though, I think it could have used six. Or more, even. Let's take some time to talk about the cast of The Idol, or rather, everybody in the cast except for Lily Rose and Abel, because they need their own sections. I actually really like the ensemble cast of The Idol. Not only do I think they do relatively well with the material they're given, but they represent a potential version of The Idol that could have been genuinely great. The first half of episode one is the best proof of what this show could have been. While Joss is doing the photo shoot for her big new single, World Class Sinner, her team deals with a, an intimacy coordinator doing his job, whom Haim locks in a bathroom, and B, a photo of Joss with Oreo fluff on her face spreading online. It is a comedy of errors performed by a confederacy of dunces. It feels like the characters are just naturally bouncing off each other and it's pretty good. Troy Sivan is good as Joss's creative director and good friend Xander. Out of all the people in Joss's posse, her Jossy, I think Xander gets the most fleshing out. He was on the same show as Joss, but due to complicated reasons, he doesn't sing much anymore. Jane Addams gets some time to relish as Nikki, this terrible music executive. Between this and Atlanta, I'd love to see her as the main character in a music industry focused show. I'm gonna make sure that you die homeless. Eric Roth does great work as this sleazy Live Nation executive. Hari Neff is a Vanity Fair reporter doing a profile oh, we do profiles. on Joss. She's fine. Rachel. Come on, it's LA. What? <laughs> it's LA! Senate is Joss's best friend and assistant, and she's responsible for some of the show's funniest bits. He's a, he's a, he's a person of color. Yeah. Are you saying he's black? You can say black. You're allowed to say black. Is he black? Yes. Okay, he's a black guy. Dan Levy is phenomenal. As Joss's publicist, he gets to deliver A1 lines like... We've subpoenaed Reddit. And... But you are a champion of women. <laughs> No, I, I'm not being sarcastic. I'm trying to draw the connection. We follow each other on Twitter. I see the links that you post. 
Yeah. And then you're linking to this photo. It's a shame he's only in the first episode, which, by the way, that scene that Abel posted in response to the Rolling Stone article, not in the final show. Divine Joy, Randolph, and Hank Azaria are great as Destiny and Haim, Joss's managers. They clearly have a lot of chemistry together, and they both get moments to show that they do care for Joss. However, as the show goes on, most of these actors are pushed to the side to bring in Tedros's cult. Rachel Sennett definitely gets the shortest end of the stick. Her whole purpose becomes looking concerned and being verbally abused by everyone. Leia, please, just for like, for like a minute, just one minute. Just one. Really it's important. Relax, I know. You're so annoying. Okay, wait, we can just play this. Leia, shut the f up, Leia! <laughs> Isaac is played by Moses Sumney, who, if you don't know, has an incredible singing voice. Go check out his record, Grey. It's a phenomenal record. He was found by Tedros while singing in church. He gets a few good moments to use that voice and to build a wee little relationship with Leia. He also has these lines in episode two when he officially meets Joss. Do you mind if I use your bathroom? Yeah, of course. There's one right. I'll find it. Like, that's his excuse to go find Leia, but I also like the idea that Isaac is just gifted at sensing the presence of bathrooms. Susanna Sun plays Chloe. She also has a good voice and gets multiple songs to show it off. She was a drug addict living on the street before Tedros found her. In that same scene where Isaac uses his bathroom senses, Chloe strips naked within three sentences. Also, in episode four, it's implied that she is underage. How old are you, Chloe? So, or 18. Mm-hmm. Like, I told myself I wasn't going to get sidetracked by the show's gratuitous nudity, but what's the point of this? Why have your character stripped down almost immediately after being introduced and then reveal that she's underage? It makes going back to episode two kind of weird and really off-putting, but for, like, no reason whatsoever. Like, what's... Why? Why? <laughs> There's also Mitch and Ramsey, who I'm pretty sure don't actually get introductions and do not add anything to the show. Mitch's lack of relevance is weird because in episodes one and five, we get these dramatic close-ups of his life is war tattoo. Plus, at one point he is shown to have a gun, and yet the most menacing action he takes in the whole show is awkwardly dancing with Leia. Mike Dean comes in for episodes four and five to play Mike Dean. The show introduces him stepping out of a car in slow-mo, ripping a bong in the same hand he's holding a blunt. Best character in the whole show. Oh wait, how could I forget? Jenny Ruby Jane from Blackpink. Oh, I know how I could forget. She's barely in this. Jenny plays Diane, a backup dancer for Joss who gets scouted by Nikki when Joss has a meltdown on set in episode two. She has her own little side story about taking Joss's big comeback single for herself, which amounts to absolutely nothing by the end. She's also secretly one of Tedros's cult members, and the scene where that is revealed is responsible for the two worst lines of dialogue in the entire show. So, is she a better f than me? Maybe. Nobody's a better f than you. So, comma, is she a better f than me? Question mark. Baby, comma, nobody's a better f than you, period. This show took the Sunday night time slot that Succession used to have. Also, real quick, what is Diane's hang up here? You said it would be good for the club. It's great for the club. Yeah, but you made music with her. You betrayed me by making music with another woman? I'm sorry, is this High School Musical too? Is Gabriella upset that Troy sang You Are the Music in Me Sharpay version with Sharpay? Get the hell out of here! But even then, as the show goes on, Tedros's cult is pushed off to the side. I wish I could be surprised that a show led by Sam Levinson would toss aside multiple promising characters to focus solely on a handful that aren't worth the overblown attention but I'm not. I'm really not. If The Idol was more like a music industry, it's always sunny in Philadelphia, then I think it could have been good. Instead, it ended up being a music industry Fifty Shades of Grey. So let's meet our Anastasia Steele and Christian Grey. Okay, we're getting into the more contentious aspects of this show, so let me start with this. I would like to see 
Lily Rose Depp in more things. As Jocelyn, she's got moments where she shines. Her breakdown in episode two while filming the music video for World Class Sinner is a prime example of this. Earlier in the episode, she got torched for changing up World Class Sinner with all the moaning. I like oh, all the please, breathing in it. don't like it. She gets to set hours behind schedule due to some cuts on her thigh and is immediately unhappy with the stage layout. As they film, she fights more and more to have her voice heard and to make this video a Amazing. I mean, it's, it's fantastic. No, no, it's not. We can't keep doing this. I'm gonna keep doing it until it's right. Take after take after take after take, and Joss still isn't happy. But then, the stars align, and she nails a take. That happens to be out of focus. It's a good take, right? I'm sorry, Joss. It was out of focus. The whole take was out of focus. Joss, you're gonna have to do it again. And from there, she just loses it. Mom? What's up, John? What? Mom? Are you calling for your mom? No. You, you didn't just call for your mom? No. My mom died last year. This whole scene is heartbreaking, and Lily Rose sells it. Whenever the show hones in on what she's gone through as a young artist, it works. Another example of this is the dinner scene in episode three. This is where more is revealed about Joss's late mom and what she would do to motivate her. Her favorite was probably hitting me with a hairbrush. She'd do it to help me remember my lines, to remember dance moves, to finish songs. She'd do it to keep me from falling asleep. Help me wake up on time. Kind of like a dog. Again, heartbreaking stuff. Especially when she admits that despite how awful the abuse was, she does miss the motivation. If you loved the music you were making, would you have felt like it was worth it? Granted, the show kind of butchers this by following it up with a musical montage where Tedros beats Joss with that hairbrush to get the motivation back, and she thanks him for helping her heal. Thank you for taking care of me. It also butchers this moment with the show's ending, but I'm getting ahead of myself. This links straight to what I said earlier about the drive to create great art and what is worth going through in order to make it. Side note, episode three also has a scene where Joss and some other characters talk directly about that theme. They reference the passing of Robert Plant's son, the song that came from it, and how that tragedy gave the world a wonderful piece of music. Yeah, but I think if Robert Plant had a say in it, he would have chosen his son's life. And that'd be a pretty big loss for the world. On one hand, I'm glad the show does touch on that concept. That's on the cool. other, I would have loved to have seen it communicated through story and character development instead of the characters just telling it at me. Point is, Lily Rose is great in these more emotional scenes. Though I will say, she cries in every single damn episode. It's a great ability to have as an actor, but it is so overused by the end. I, I became numb to it. When it comes to the music side of Jocelyn, there's a problem. First, and this is not an original complaint, but Jocelyn is a terrible pop star name. Like, say that a few times. Jocelyn. Jocelyn. Notice how it's a concerted effort to say the name properly. Compare it to the names of real pop stars. Taylor Swift, Lady Gaga, Ariana Grande, Beyonce, Jocelyn. Second, I'd like to take a second and revisit the Amy Simons version of The Idol, because there's only been one visual of it leaked to the public. I'm not going to show the images because every time I see them, HBO quickly unleashes the DMCA dogs. What I'll say is, they very clearly show Jocelyn's early career as a family-friendly pop star. Clear influence from early Britney Spears or Disney Channel-era Miley Cyrus. If that version of The Idol had made it to air, and if it had the same general arc as the Sam Levinson version, then the transformation from squeaky clean singer to debaucherous debonair would have been crystal clear. But here's the thing. In the final version of The Idol, the music Joss is making before Tedros comes in is already dirty. The song they're prepping to release is called World Class Sinner, and it has lyrics like this. And every weekend, I'm trying to find someone. 
And by the end of the show, Joss's music isn't substantially different. This isn't Baby One More Time to I'm a Slave for You, it's Bangers to Dead Pets. We do get some passing mentions to Joss's life before the show. Talia mentions the show Joss was on. I meet you. I actually grew up watching you on Rock House. Oh my god. And Leia does mention that World Class Center is a new direction for Joss. Well, that's because it's different than anything you've ever done before. But I cannot overstate how much I would have liked to have seen, with my eyes, as the viewer, what her direction was like before. Even like, old photos, old commercials of the show she was on. I think this is another result of the show being reshot as fast as possible. They didn't have the time or money to shoot things like that. This ties into the larger fact that they don't really show the process of Joss's creative rebirth because she doesn't really change by the end of the show, nor does her whole situation. There's more to her character that I'd like to discuss, but we would have to get into the show's ending. And before I do that, we gotta talk about him. You know what I think it is? What? I think you're gay. I ain't gay. I'm going to start this section off by speaking directly to Abel Tesfe. Now, don't get me wrong, I am under no impression that one of the biggest pop stars of our generation has the time or desire to watch any of my videos. However, Abel proved himself to be extremely online for this particular project, so if there were any video of mine he was going to watch, it's probably this one. Hi Abel. I'm a big fan of your work. I've been following you ever since the Stereo Gum post about House of Balloons back in 2011. You are responsible for some of this decade's best pop songs. The journey you've taken from anonymous, internet-savvy R&B crooner to world-conquering pop star that even my mom likes has been wild to witness. Plus, I've enjoyed seeing the creative direction that you and your team have taken, not just with the music, but with the visuals as well, specifically on your two most recent albums. Most importantly, in interviews, you've been saying that you're stepping into a new phase of your creative journey and that you're even planning to kill off the weekend. The Idol seems to be your first step in that creative transition, and regardless of what anyone is saying about this show, including myself, I want you to know that I am glad that you're taking risks. I am glad that you are pushing yourself outside of your comfort zone and trying new things. Because the worst thing you could do, both for yourself and for us as an audience, is to hold back, to be creatively stagnant on purpose. I'm a big fan of your work. And your performance as Tedros was bad. This feels like a little extreme. Extreme? You want to know what's extreme? My servitude. My devotion to you. The first thing we need to say about Tedros Tedros, that's his name, by the way, or like his real name is Mauricio Jackson, but for most of the show, he's rocking a name suited for the 1993 Mario movie. Anyway, Tedros is kind of a dweeb. Pop music is like the ultimate Trojan horse. You get people to dance, you get people to sing along. He's out here in episode one talking about how pop music is a Trojan horse and how Prince and Donna Summer changed the world. And listen, I don't think he's wrong, but that's the kind of thing that I would say on the YouTube channel where I rant about Crazy Frog and Eiffel 65. The core character, a pop music obsessed pig who just happens to have enough charisma to lead a cult moonlighting as an artist roster, is kinda great. Plus, Abel's job here had the potential to be pretty easy. Like, it's a bit of a catch-22 in Abel's favor. If Abel was genuinely Abel, to bring a creepy energy to Tedros, then mission accomplished. He did a good job acting, well done. But if he didn't, and his attempts to be creepy just came off as genuinely off-putting, then, I mean, he still did it, right? That's the kind of rationale I saw online from people defending Abel's performance. Oh, you thought he was creepy? That was the point. But there's a deeper disconnect here. In an interview with Complex, Abel cited a few inspirations for his performance. Eric Roberts in Star 80, James Woods in Casino, Dennis Hopper in Blue Velvet, Harvey Keitel in Taxi Driver. Now, those are all legendary performances worth aspiring to. When you see those characters on screen, even for a brief moment, they own their time. Eric and Dennis in particular, they are simply magnetic. Well, it turns out, 
Abel wanted to put a bit of a spin on that kind of character. In that same Complex interview, he says, With someone like Tedros, it should be tough for a lot of actors wanting to play a character like that. I went into it like, why pull the punches? Why take you down a journey and romanticize him? Let's just jump right into it. He's a f***ing scumbag. We notice a trend in people being attracted to people playing serial killers and stalkers, and I tried everything in my power to make him as despicable on screen that can make your skin crawl. I wanted to contradict the trope of these characters needing to be charming and attractive to the audience. In other words, the question that was asked when building Tedros was, you know these degenerate characters who clearly had sinister values but were still charismatic and captivating and fun to watch? Well, what if that kind of character was not charismatic and not captivating and not fun to watch? We sure found out. Actually, I should give Abel his flowers. Like with most things in this show, episode one shows the potential his performance had. He's clearly a slimeball. He approaches Joss's mansion like a damn Sith Lord, he smooches Leia, he ominously plays the piano, he rehearses his hello to Joss in the mirror. Hello, Angel. This kind of character aligns with what Abel was describing, but in a way that's kind of enjoyable to watch. But as the show goes on, Tedros becomes something else. He starts to be treated as a more serious threat to Joss and everyone else. He begins to exert more control over everyone in the mansion, even bringing Xander into his little cult by the end. So, he's not pathetic anymore, right? Because the other characters don't seem to think he's pathetic. They seem concerned about him and Joss. Then, in episode 4, Destiny basically just lays out his entire backstory, his real name, his life as a pimp, his time in jail after beating an ex-girlfriend. By this point, there's no longer any speculation about what he's capable of. This kind of shift would require Abel to sell it. It would require him to communicate actual intensity. Let me catch you looking at her again. Let me catch you looking at her again. I'm not. Let me catch you looking at her again. I'm sorry, Let me I'm not. Fucking catch you looking at her again. I'll fucking drag you down Rodeo while your fucking ass was fucking stomp you. I'll fucking curb stomp I'm you. I'm sorry. I'll fucking curb stomp you. I'm sorry. I don't. I'm not sure what you were interpreting, but let me see I wasn't it. doing anything. Let me see it. And he just doesn't. Look, I get what Abel was saying about those famously sleazy characters. If they existed in the real world, they would not be fun to watch. They would not be worth emulating in any way. But those characters being both terrible yet mesmerizing is kind of their point? It's media. It's meant to tell a story, take us on a journey, stir up emotions in a safe way. Those characters being poor role models yet captivating to watch is supposed to make us feel sympathy for their victims, to understand why Dorothy doesn't just get up and leave Paul Snyder, or why Jeffrey doesn't just walk away laughing when Frank Booth yells at him about his choice of beer. What kind of beer do you like? Heineken? Fuck that shit! Paps Blue Ribbon! Just because I'm watching a show with a bad person doesn't mean I'm gonna go become a bad person. This line of thinking reminds me of the discourse that was popping up around Euphoria's second season. This idea that if some media depicts a morally questionable character or action, then it is endorsing said character or action. In fact, I began to realize something. Despite the sex and the swearing and the slurs, this approach to Tedros is shockingly Puritan, especially since this is from the guy who has sung lyrics like this. You said you might be into girls, said you're going through a phase, but keeping your heart safe. Maybe you can bring a friend, she can ride on top your face, while I f*** you straight. Simply put, Abel's performance as Tedros is not missing creepiness, it's missing charisma. It would be better if he was able to bring charisma to this slime ball, because it would make his downfall enjoyable to watch. Like in episode 4, seeing him in tears with his girl running back to the arms of her ex, looking wistfully at her Prince poster. Okay, sorry, quick tangent. When this show was airing back in June, I was working on my Prince video. Have you seen it? It's basically a full-length feature film. Bring your family over for movie night. Make some popcorn, too. I was diving into his discography deeply, learning what made him the legend he was and still is. I don't know why the idol kept 
mentioning him. Tedros first mentions Prince at the club when he meets Joss. Then he notices the poster in Joss's mansion in episode two. Then the longing look in episode four, Finally, in episode 5, Joss makes fun of him and how he already knew about the poster, but was playing dumb to get close to her. Why did you evoke Prince's name so much? I don't get it, it doesn't build to anything. Is it just because he's Prince and he's, he's huge? I mean, if you really wanted to do something interesting, uh, Prince was, of course, a musical genius, but for all of his prowess, he was also notoriously difficult to work with. So... Uh, you know, there's something there where you could use him as a symbol for that artistic aspiration, but also the lengths that you would have to go in order to achieve musical greatness, and the things you would have to do, and the people you might have to step on and pass by in order to make your own dream come true. But no, that would be interesting. Um, I think the reality is Abel just has a Prince poster in his house, and the team made reference to it a couple of times. Ah, well. All right, I talk about music. With the airing of each episode, we also got an EP containing tracks from said episode. In truth, I don't really have much to say about the individual songs. They're all fine. I like Mike Dean's main theme for the show. I like the electric guitars wailing throughout the outro on Take Me Back. I love Moses Sumney's song, Get It Before. If that song is any indication of what Moses is gonna do for his next album, I could not be more excited. Chloe's songs are all fine, even though they do feel a bit juvenile, which I suppose makes sense, given that she is technically a juvenile. I'd probably like them more if Chloe as a character had any real growth or personality. Jocelyn's songs are basically weekend songs if they were sung by a woman, and I don't mean a woman singing in the style of The Weeknd about illicit sex, I mean The Weeknd writing songs from what he thinks is a woman's perspective. And if you were to tell me Abel's songs started life as demos for After Hours or Dawn FM that were left on the cutting room floor, I wouldn't be all that surprised. But then I got curious because Abel stars in the show, but his voice often soundtracks key moments in the show. So are these supposed to be Tedros's inner monologues put to songs? Or is Abel serving as an omniscient Greek chorus for the audience? Do both Tedros and The Weeknd exist in the Idolverse? That would have major ramifications for future Idol installments, all zero of them. All right, let's go over the last episode and the twists contained therein. Episode five kicks off with the reveal that Joss has been pulling the strings this whole time. How has she been doing it? I don't know, she just has. And by proxy, Tedros is a complete wreck now who has lost his relationships with his cult members and Mike Dean. Chloe, when did uh, Tedros first bring me up? I mean, he's been manifesting this for what are you forever. Th Chloe, no, that's not true. I want to emphasize that this first twist basically comes out of nowhere. Xander mentions it when he's getting shocked in episode four. <laughs> she fucking controls everything around her and everyone. And now she's doing it to you. But there's no grand reveal of Joss's plan to manipulate Tedros. It's just, well, you've served your purpose. Again, I know this show was only meant to have five episodes, but it feels like there's an episode missing or even just a scene showing that Joss had the upper hand. Anyway, Joss's team come over, the culties do their little talent show, and everyone's like, oh my God, these are the greatest musicians who have ever lived. I know that's pretty rude, and the individual musicians have their talents, but this moment would have actually felt good if any of them had developed as characters. Like, Nikki tears up at one of Chloe's songs? Why? This show has done nothing to make me care for Chloe outside of her underage drug addict story, and they've done nothing to make me feel sympathy for Nikki. Why would this ever work? Meanwhile, Leia is trying to tell Joss about her ex, Rob. I have not fully talked about Rob yet, but here's the lowdown. He had cheated on Joss before the show started. He gets reference in passing once in episode two. She was cheated on by somebody who loved her. Yeah, heartthrob Rob. When Joss learns that Diane was in cahoots with Tedros to get 
get her to the club in episode one, she invites him over as revenge. He enters the house, soundtracked by Mike Dean playing Black Sabbath's Paranoid on piano. He and Tedros have some cordial conversation. What are you, a f it? Then Joss whisks him away for some fun times. When he leaves, he gets sidetracked by new cult member Xander and one of Tedros's girls. Rob and the girl take a photo, but the girl starts getting way too handsy with him. Rob leaves. <sighs> At some point between then and episode 5, that photo leaks and is used to create false rape accusations against Rob, which leads to his career downfall. Leia's trying to tell Joss about that. When the news breaks to the room, Joss officially kicks Tedros out. Heim recounts the story of Red Riding Hood to the big bad Tedros, while Joss prays outside. Joss then does her little musical number with her new song, Dollhouse. It is a C-tier Lana Del Rey demo that is incredibly on the nose at times. I do like the choreography though, but Lily Rose, you mimic pulling an arrow back on a bow at one point, but you release it with the wrong hand. That's poor technique, come on. And then there's the ending. I had two theories on how the show would end. The first was the obvious one, Joss kills Tedros. This is supported by the clip of Basic Instinct in episode one. What happens? She kills him. My second theory was the one that I really wanted to have happen. At the end, it would turn out that Tedros does not exist. He was just a figment of Joss's imagination. This would have been supported by A, Joss having a history of hallucinations, according to Nikki in episode two. Get a call that you are out of your fucking mind, babbling up on the roof, talking to uh, things in outer fucking space. Right. And B, this one bit in the same episode where Leia is pressured to do coke with the gang and the edit cuts between Leia being embraced by Tedros to Leia being embraced by Joss. I did not edit that by the way. That is actually how it happens in the final show. You might be saying, Mike, that twist would make absolutely no sense and would ruin the entire show. To which I say, that is the exact reason why it would have been such a good twist. I would have, every moment of watching this show would have been validated by such an insane twist. In reality though, this is what happens. Haim convinces Talia to change the focus of her story from Jocelyn to Tedros. Now, just that piece about Vanity Fair raises so many questions to me because first off, and I mean this with kindness, who cares about Tedros outside of the people in this story? Of course, Tedros should see justice for what he's done, but you're telling me Vanity Fair would suddenly drop its exclusive profile on a huge pop star making a big comeback? All just to focus on some sleazy pimp? in LA. Also, that story would definitely impact Joss since there is 100% footage of the two of them together in public. But if I keep focusing on this, we're going to be here all day. So moving on. A few weeks later, and Joss is performing at SoFi Stadium. She's wearing this red hood, which is not only a reference to Haim's monologue, but also a nice callback to this brief moment in episode one when Tedros puts the red sheet over her head. That was genuinely a good detail that I think was planned. So good job there. Team. Tedros comes to the stadium and finds a guest pass for Mauricio Jackson. When they meet backstage, Tedricio finds the hairbrush that Joss's mom used to abuse her. But he notices something. It's brand new. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, before we get into that, let me wrap up this ending. Joss then goes out to perform at SoFi Stadium, which was filmed during one of the weekend's concerts. This is funny because if you went to one of those shows, congrats, you basically had the ending of The Idol spoiled for you months before it came out. Joss introduces the audience to Tedros, the love of her life, her team gets raging mad, they kiss, and she whispers, You're mine. Forever. Joss stands tall, credits roll. Then we get this montage of behind the scenes bloopers, which, okay, the cast looks like they had fun, but why would you end your sordid tale of twisted sex and manipulation with a montage of people having a blast? I asked earlier, but genuinely, 
<laughs> is this High School Musical too? So no, Tedros does not die. If Sam Levinson was here, I imagine he would say something about how Tedros actually did die inside and how he was the real victim. This pimp from the Midwest who shows up in Beverly Hills ends up being the victim. Now, kudos to the show. The brush reveal is a striking twist. The most intense interpretation you could have is that Joss lied about her mom abusing her. To reveal that your series protagonist would lie about something so emotional is a bold thing to do. But once you do one thing, just one thing, this twist, and to some extent, the whole show fall apart. And that thing is, watch the show leading up to the twist. Which you probably would have done because this was the season finale. So if you're like me, once you learn that twist, you start going back to times in the show when Joss's relationship with her mom was discussed. For example, the dinner scene in episode 3, where Joss reveals the abuse for the first time. When I re-watched the show, I was especially keen to see how Xander and Leia reacted. And they clearly knew, or at least had been told by Joss, that it was happening. In fact, the entire conversation about her mom was started by Xander. Her mom was like a rare breed. So at first I was like, wait, her close friends clearly know about Joss's mom, so she couldn't have been lying. But then Xander says in episode four when he's getting electrocuted, Why don't you tell anyone that her mother was humiliating her and beating her? She asked me not to f***ing tell anyone, so I didn't. That's not f***ing true, Xander. You f***ing did! So maybe that was the line she gave everyone. Plus, Rob hints at the actual relationship she and her mom shared. I have this image of you giving her a bath. You're always so tender with her. I can't imagine how f***ing difficult this must be. But let's keep going. A few times throughout the course of the show, we see Joss going to town on her hair with the exactly brush. If the abuse from her mom was real, then these scenes do a great job of showing the ramifications of that abuse, how it has stayed with Joss, and how she is conjuring her mother through this aggressive brushing. But if the abuse isn't real, what's the point? Why would she be brushing so hard? Is this all part of Joss's master plan to damage her hair? And at this point, I'd like to weave the two twists of episode 5 together. Joss lying about her mom, and Joss being the puppeteer behind this entire situation. Because looking at the show as a whole, I was left wondering, what was Joss trying to do? Let's look back at other events. Did she manipulate her team to lock the intimacy coordinator in the bathroom? Did she intentionally leak the Oreo fluff photo? Was her meltdown on the world-class center set planned? Did she hijack the camera to go out of focus? Did she plan to take world-class center back from Diane to screw her career over, even though she stated multiple times that she did not like the song? Did she want Leia to leave? Did she want to incite a walkout at her label? Your employees stage a walkout claiming Jocelyn's music's misogynistic and you weren't scared. It's a twist, yeah, but the questions it raises are bad. I don't feel like I'm following a trail of carefully laid breadcrumbs. I feel like I'm making excuses for why a story was being told poorly. I was so caught up with all these loose threads that I began to wonder, was I misreading the twist? Like, is the twist just, she bought a new hairbrush? Because that could work, you know, Joss buying it again as a reminder of the trauma in her life. But then I watched the Inside Episode 5 video, and everybody they interview speaks in very serious terms about what Joss did. In the end, we really see Jocelyn's true colors. You don't think people are capable of hiding who they really are? She needs to devour those around her to feel like she's got something to say. So yeah, I think she did lie about the abuse. What materially changes if Joss never met Tedros? Joss would still have a mansion. She would still have adoring fans who would chase her down in the street. She could still play huge venues. She could still go around the world and work with big producers. She would still have a music studio in her house decked out with Ableton Live. She could still enjoy the benefits that come with fame. Sure, she might not be making transcendent in art like she told Haim she wanted to in episode two. I want to be bigger than this song. I want to be a once in a generation artist and I want to make music that lasts longer than my life. But maybe she was lying about that too. Oh wait, I just realized it's all making sense to me now. 
She just wanted a new chef. <laughs> that was the true goal of her whole plot, and the rest was just icing on the cake. And there it is. Show's over, and I do genuinely mean the show is over. I wrote most of this video with the possibility that the idol could come back for a second season. It's not. It got canceled. Even with its short episode count, I would not recommend you check the idol out, even as a campy so bad it's good watch. But I also don't like ending this on a down note, so let me hit you with some recommendations. You want to see what Lily Rose Depp can do with a decent script? The King with Timothy Chalamet shimmy ya shimmy ye. Want more Dan Levy? Shits Creek all day. Rachel Sennett? Bam! Shiva Baby, such a good film. Ari Neff was good in this year's Barbie movie. Divine Joy Randolph was great in Only Murders in the Building. Susanna Sun's breakout role was in Red Rocket. I haven't seen it yet, but that got some great reviews. Hank Azaria doesn't do too much live action stuff, but he was recently on the final season of Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. That whole show is a great time. Eli Roth also hasn't done much in front of the camera recently, but Inglorious Bastards is still a good time. Watch The Bear. It doesn't relate to anyone in the idol, but it's a great great show that recently wrapped a phenomenal second season. Watch Atlanta 2, shout out Jane Addams, and while we're on the FX train, I've even heard good things about Lil Dicky show Dave, so check that out if that interests you. Hell, if you want to see Sam Levinson at his best, first season of Euphoria, plus it's two bonus episodes. They're still very good TV. Listen to Grey, listen to Troye Sivan's new record, stream Blackpink for clear skin and a pure soul, even go back and listen to Dawn FM and After Hours again. All of these are better ways to spend your time than watching The Idol. <sighs>